I come, my friends, to right <coughs> a great wrong. Be there any here of the British nobility? Ah. By British, you mean somebody or something? I was referring to those Norman hunters. <laughs> Be there any man here who is an enemy of truth? Ah, good. We've eliminated all of the surplus dishonest people at once. <laughs> so I can pursue truth. Many of you have heard a tale. A tale of young Harry. He went to France to claim his lands. Who was met on the field by the dolphin. And by large hordes which outnumbered him. Many of you have heard this tale, but many of you have heard it through the forked tongue fawning lies of a man named Shakespeare. There is a maligned and misunderstood and denied hero in this tale. And it is of that hero that I would tell you. That hero was not one man. That hero was a people. Henry, as you all know, took his claim to the French throne to France. He met on the fields of Agincourt, not a handful, not an equal number, but five, ten, fifteen times his number of French troops. The man was grossly outnumbered. The man had no hope and no prayer upon the field. Yet, by God, he was English. <laughs> <laughs> by God, he would carry the dead. <laughs> well, the French charged, as only the French can charge, in perfect formation, banners flying and flapping, full of lace and dividing, and full of horror and terror. And so they proceeded across the field towards the British, who were ready to meet them. But before the French could lie lance upon the English, the strong Welsh bowmen fired their first volley, and the French fell in droves. And the second Welsh volley fell, and the French fell in droves and pulled back and retreated. Yes, no matter what you may have read, no matter what the bard of Avon may have told you, the first French attack was repulsed without ever the laying of sword on armor by the Welsh bowmen. The French regrouped, and again the French attacked, and again they came forward in a mighty and dangerous thundering horde. And again, the Welsh bowmen fired their volley, and again the French fell down. The French regrouped. And the story is one you've heard before. In mighty thundering hordes they fell forward. In mighty thundering hordes they fell. In the Welsh folk. <laughs> now, those of you who think in terms of grand epic battles must realize there's one element missing here. After all, if we don't have a British lord slicing his way through the French, we have no story, no honor, or no glory, have we? Therefore, the fact that they were winning seeming irrelevant. The Norman lords made very clear that the Welshmen were not to engage anymore. They wanted to fight. They come all this way. By Gedry, they were going to fight. Well, this leaves, of course, a bunch of Welshmen with nothing to do. <laughs> When a Welshman is born, he will do one of three things. The first is he will drink. <laughs> Perhaps I should say four things, because the second is also he will drink. <laughs> the second, perhaps the most terrifying of the three, is he will sing. <laughs> Needless to say, the English, not wanting this caterwauling, <laughs> said to the Welsh, 
Step the far and far away while we charge. <laughs> the fourth thing the Welshman will do. Good guess, close, but not quite correct. The fourth thing he will do is he will make mischief. Now, they drank for a while, and they sang for a while, and the battle kept on railing, and the British were not getting the best of it, but they were fighting. But the Dauphin had things prepared, and his reinforcements were up on the hill, ready to charge down at the crucial moment, wipe out the British scoutmen from their lands, and settle the question of secession once and for all. Everyone remember the poor Welshman? <laughs> you wonder what they were doing during this time? Making mischief. Making mischief. They took up their cudgels, and they snuck around to where all the French reinforcements were sitting. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to war. I don't know how many of you have ever been reinforcements. It's a lot of fun. You sit there with your armor all off at a pile, saying, yeah, yeah, come on, battle, go badly for my side so I can do something. <laughs> and you're watching the battle, right? Maybe somebody important will fall. Maybe this will be my big moment. Maybe I can be a hero. Well, when you're standing in no armor, looking at the battle, bouncing around, <laughs> you're a very good target for a Welsh club. <laughs> I make none of this story up, by the way, my friends. It's all true, regardless of what the bard has told you. So the Welshman knocked out the entire French reinforcements, picked them up, dragged them back to camp, tied them up, that insult to injury, they sang at them. <laughs> And there was the Dauphin. His moment was ready. His troops were tired. He had set himself up. It was time for the reinforcements. He called them ahead. Where are my reinforcements? <laughs> They're supposed to be reinforcements. We're singing with the world. <laughs> and so the battle was won by the English, uh, yeah. who, through great nobility and superior swordsmanship, not to mention, and for whatever you do, don't mention a bunch of drunken Welsh bowmen. <laughs> now, you may think this is a noble tale, but there's one more thing you should be aware of. The Welshmen had held back the French with their volleys. They had cudgeled them and knocked them out. They had taken them back to their camps for ransom. Do you know who the greatest enemy Accomplished that day was the greatest enmity, the greatest hatred. The English never forgave the Welsh for laying their hands on nobility. <laughs> and that is the truth, my friends, regardless of what the Bard has told you. <laughs>